My parents were very neglectful, emotionally abusive, and sometimes even physically abusive. I was the third girl that they had, and they only ever wanted boys. My mom told me this. I was told the doctor said I was going to be a boy, but he was wrong. Apparently that's when their life went downhill because girls are just quote bad and all become whores. I lost respect for my parents very young. I believe it was around the time I started going to pre-K. I was a very independent thinker. I had to be. My mother had convinced herself that all I wanted to do with my life was get pregnant and make myself even more of a burden. She started calling me names around the time I was eight. Because of this, I literally never asked for anything other than food and shelter. I put myself in a corner and tried my best to be quiet. I was taught I was just wasted space. She never allowed me to go play or go to the parks. She kept me locked in the house until I was a teen. I'd spend summers isolated from society, and it was really depressing. Books kept me alive, literally. By the time I was 16, I figured out how to sneak out without getting caught. I used to walk miles just to see my secret friends. I was always told I was stupid and wouldn't do anything with my life with my little woman brain. I was shamed for needing to shave and when I got my period. My dad never cared enough to comment on how my sisters and I were treated. By the way, I was an honor student and athletic. None of it mattered to them. They tried to force me to quit sports because they didn't believe I was actually in sports. They thought I was hanging out with boys and having sex. I didn't even lose my virginity until I was 17, and it was with a long-term boyfriend that I had in secret. At this point, they were beating me when I'd come home after practice. I was supposed to be home by 3 p.m. every day and never out on weekdays even though I was in high school. I spent my whole childhood taking care of myself and making sure I didn't cross paths with my mother. I was severely depressed most of the time. I remember once even contemplating suicide and telling my friend through the internet. I'll never forget what he told me. The best revenge is to live a happy life the way you want it and proving them wrong. He probably doesn't even know that I never to this day forgot what he had said and it literally fueled me for the next few years. I did great in the SATs and graduated in the top 10% of my class and I was even on the champion varsity team. I quietly applied to engineering school come senior year. I did everything myself. I even found their tax returns and filled out the FAFSA myself so I could get grants. I ended up getting three prestigious internships. The Christmas before graduation, I let them know how awful they were to me and that they did nothing to help me grow or teach me how to be an adult. They definitely didn't teach me self-worth. I let them know I owe them nothing and I was moving on. I graduated with a job in one of the best engineering companies in the world. I moved to the city and found the love of my life. I eventually moved out of the city due to COVID and now have my own place and I'm the only one in my family with their stuff together really. They still deny everything done to me and claim they never beat or called me names. It's not even a factor in my life. I know that I've been strong enough to make it through anything from the time I was born. I was born to survive and thrive. I was absolutely obsessed with this guy in college. I thought he was so smart and interesting and read all the right books and watched all the right movies and he was an engineering student. I pined after him. We were quote best friends and friends with benefits. Everyone thought we were dating but he'd never hold my hand, just sleep with me and act like I was embarrassing. After college, he turned to me one day and said, you know we're dating now, right? Sometime after that, he told me he didn't love me and that he never would, but that he did like me a lot. He told me my friends didn't like me much either. He was isolating and had major anger problems. One time we played in a tournament together. When I beat him, he ignored me for the next four hours. Everyone there knew that we were dating they thought it was weird that he acted like he couldn't see me. It was really embarrassing. He had no control over his emotions and thought it was quote natural and the way he was. I struggled with depression and couldn't even talk to him about it because if I did, I made him feel bad and had to comfort him. Everything was so exhausting and everything was about him. He shamed me about my body, he was always right, and I was always wrong. I was weird, I was embarrassing, and I needed to change. One day, I realized he wasn't smart, basically at all, and the paradigm shift made him make so much more sense. I told him I thought we should break up, and he almost immediately proposed. I said maybe, but I realized soon that I had to make up my mind and that I had to leave. 
I was so afraid that there was no one else in the world for me though, not even friends. We broke up, and he threatened multiple times to kill himself. My ex eventually moved away, and he owes me enough money that he has me blocked everywhere now. It turns out that was a boon for my recovery though, never having to worry about running into him, never seeing any of his social media. We had the same hobby, but he dropped it, and that's where I met my now husband. He loves my weirdness. I have all new friends who aren't mean, and I'm seeing a therapist for my depression and have a psychiatrist as well. My husband supports me while I sort out my issues, and he continuously reassures me that I have intrinsic value and that he loves me, and I make him happy and it's okay for me to take some time to figure out what I can do to help myself. The rest of my life is filled with potential. My last contact with my ex, he told me he couldn't pay me back because he tried to move out from his parents, but the new place had mold and he was drowning in debt. Where he lives, there's not many job opportunities. Maybe I'm bitter for holding on to this grudge, but I spent five years following this asshole around and trying to change who I was for him and never doing it right. And now, my life is so much better than I ever realized it could be. Also, in hindsight, I totally did have some good friends who loved and worried about me. I hid a lot of his bad behavior out of embarrassment, but I couldn't hide it all. I should have reached out, and I should have asked for help. His actions were embarrassing for him and not for me. For anyone who felt as trapped as I did, I hope you realize that there are so many people out there, and starting with nothing is way better than continuing while poisoning yourself. I was 16 and I was given the opportunity to work at a grocery store in the small town where I lived. It was basically the only place for a teenager to work in town, so I was lucky to have the job. I never worked past 10.30 p.m., and my boss made sure that my work didn't interfere with my school activities, and the work made me happy. In the beginning, my duties included stocking shelves at night and cleaning the entire store. My boss quickly recognized and rewarded my hard work with more responsibility. I went from stock boy and cleaner to cashier to evening manager once I graduated high school. My duties as the evening manager included running the store at night, reconciling sales, taking deposits to the bank, and locking up after work. I had a great relationship with my store manager, and even the regional manager over our area of stores. This store was one of a few dozen in a chain started by the owner of an oil company as a way to distribute his gasoline. The employees held a high regard for the owner, In the few times he visited the store he was kind and he thanked us for our work. He was working toward his retirement and his son-in-law was transitioning into the CEO role. As many teenagers did in the 90s, I grew out my hair. As my hair was growing out longer, my regional manager asked me kindly to keep my hair out of my eyes, either in a store cap or in a ponytail. There were no rules for appearance in the small company, but he wanted me to be as professional and approachable as possible since I was in a position of management. I was happy to oblige. In the late 90s, the store was being remodeled and ownership and sea level folks in the company were coming around more often. Evidently, one of the quote good old boy higher ups in the company didn't like my appearance and said something about it to my regional manager. I was a valued employee and my regional manager made it clear that my appearance was a non-issue. He reminded him that there were no rules against my long hair in the company guidelines. Nevertheless, my regional manager made me aware of the situation and warned me that this higher up might be around again and to be on my toes if he said something. A couple of weeks later, this higher up came back to the store with some paperwork to deliver to the store manager. I had been instructed ahead of time to take the paperwork on her behalf, but she didn't know who would be delivering it. I had just cut off my long hair days before and had pierced both of my ears. The same executive walked up to the counter where I was checking groceries and asked for the manager. I told them that I was the manager on duty, and I was expecting some paperwork to be delivered. I don't remember the exact words, but they were something like, You couldn't be in charge. Our company would never put someone that looked like you in charge. I was completely caught off guard. I asked him what he meant. He said that I looked like a girl with my ears pierced, and that there's no place for that here. He said that I had to take off the earrings. I respectfully defended myself. I told them that there were no rules established for appearance. I had been a model employee for several years and was entrusted with the store every evening that I worked. He reprimanded me in front of some of our regular customers for talking back to him. He left the paperwork and walked out of the store. I saw him pull out his cell phone and take a call as he was leaving. 
It was only a few minutes later when my regional manager called the store to talk with me. He wanted to hear my side of the story. He apologized, but told me this guy was hell-bent on making an issue of my appearance. A week went by and I saw that I was scheduled for a Saturday morning. That was unusual since I was the night manager. I arrived for work and the regional manager was there. He talked with me in the office and told me how sorry he was to have to let me go. I asked on what grounds and he replied with insubordination. I was at a loss. Even to this day, I've never been so much as written up in any place of employment. I told my regional manager that I was going to fight this. He even did me the courtesy of writing the number down for the EEOC, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, from the poster in the office. I went home, which was with my parents as I was home from college for the summer, and explained to my dad what was happening. He didn't really want me to pursue the EEOC thing, but I was determined to stand up for myself against this quote good old boy corporate bully. After speaking with someone at the EEOC office, she believed I had a case for wrongful termination. They offered to see me that afternoon. Before driving to Dallas to meet with someone about my case, I decided to give the company a chance to rescind the firing. I really liked my job. I loved the people at the store and all the customers I got to interact with every day. I didn't think I would be able to find another job that gave me the flexibility to work weekends through music school and give me full hours at every break. I really wanted to make this work, so I called the corporate offices. After some time on hold, I was actually passed along to the CEO of the company, remember, the son-in-law, who was now fully in charge after the wonderful owner had retired. He was aware of the firing, because he likely approved it, but he only had heard the side of the story that came from his entrusted, bigoted, corporate bully friend. I respectfully told the CEO that I would love to meet with him and have the opportunity to share my side of the story. I wanted to give him the whole picture of who I was, not some idea based on my appearance. He told me that he didn't need to meet with me to understand that I was a brat trying to get away with being disrespectful to the administrator in the company. I told him that I was planning on meeting with the EEOC that afternoon, and thanked him for his time. After my meeting, the person in charge of my case filed paperwork for wrongful termination. She said it would take a little bit of time, but that the company would likely have to pay me an average salary for the next six months. I wish I could remember all the details of this. It was a pretty sweet deal. I got to take a semester off from working and fully focus on my college studies while getting a paycheck in the mail. It was actually really great. Then came the lawsuit. The company stood by their claim that one instance of insubordination was a legal grounds to fire me, and that I was being insubordinate by not complying with the demands of a high-level employee. I received a letter in the mail that the company was suing me for a sum equal to the pay that they had given me over the six-month period. I don't remember exactly everything from that letter, but I do remember something about there being so many labor lawsuits that they did their best to handle them over the phone. I was to call into a number at a specific time to have a conference call hearing with a labor judge. I had to tell one of my professors that I would miss class one day for the hearing. I sat on my bed in my college apartment while I listened over the phone to two attorneys for the company argue their case against me. The CEO of the company was on the line as well. The judge had a copy of my employee handbook for my time at the company, which had no mention of employee appearance. My manager and regional manager had given positive testimony on my behalf. The judge essentially told the company that this was completely petty, that their legal cost far exceeded the six month of pay that they had given me. He told them it appeared that they were making this personal. His ruling was that I would keep the six months of pay, thank goodness because I had been spending it. But that wasn't my revenge. After my job-free semester of college, it was time to get a holiday job that I could hopefully keep on the weekends and change to full-time during my last summer before student teaching and graduating. I applied at a retail giant that had an excessive electronics section. I wanted to sell electronics. During my final interview, the HR agent asked about my firing. She had a great time listening to the story. She asked if I would mind taking off my earrings for work as it was against corporate policy for men. I told her that I would be absolutely fine taking off my earrings. Not only was it against their policy, I was planning to be a teacher soon anyway. Male teachers in Texas just didn't wear earrings at the time. I did well at this store. HDTVs had just become a thing, and projection big screens were selling like hotcakes. I was working on commission, and the paychecks were great. I worked with a lot of folks that didn't understand all the facets of the transition to the HDTV, and really could answer some important questions for customers. HDTVs weren't priced like they are today. 
Most of the name brands were $4,000 and up at the time. Consumers desired a lot of confidence with purchases of that amount, and I quickly became the go-to guy on this. Happy customers would send friends and family to me, and I loved this job. I was lucky to make one of my best sales to a retired couple that had means to buy the best of everything. They wanted the best, but they wanted to understand all the details and be confident in their purchase. They had been to a few places that weren't able to answer their questions, and then they came to me. There was something familiar about the gentleman, though. It felt like I knew him from somewhere, but I couldn't quite place it. When making the purchase, customers had to give me their names and address for delivery. I was absolutely stunned to hear his name. It was the former owner of the grocery store chain where I used to work. I hadn't recognized him in casual clothes and out of the store environment. His wife was wonderfully sweet and very complimentary of me. She said that she was about to give her family some monetary gifts for the holidays so that they could have HDTVs at their homes. She was going to recommend that they come to see me for the purchase. I still remember how I felt the day the son-in-law CEO came to my store and asked for Greg, only our first names were on our name tags. He didn't really visit the grocery store like his father-in-law and ran the company from the company headquarters. I had only seen him once in my years at the company, but I knew it was him when I shook his hand and he told me his name. I actually trembled with nervousness and probably a little anger as I answered his questions. I must have seemed strange before I composed myself. I smiled as he mentioned how much his in-laws thought of me, and I got him set up with his needs. He thanked me profusely and told me that it was hard to find reliable information and good service these days. I told him that if he needed anything to come back and see me, I rarely used them because I was only going to be there for a year, but I pulled out a business card and handed it to him. I told him to ask for Greg, Greg Hamilton. He looked at the card and slowly looked up at my eyes. Greg Hamilton? Yes sir, Greg Hamilton. I'm so happy I was able to help you today. I take a lot of pride in my work, and I hope that it shows. There was a long, awkward stare before he walked away. He actually turned back and took another look at me before leaving the store. I'll never know what he was thinking, but I like to think that he realized that he fired a respectable young man that took pride in his work, solely based on bias. The best revenge doesn't come from hurting someone. Deep down, what we really desire is to help someone learn a lesson. I'm so thankful that I had the chance as a young man to teach an important lesson to this CEO. One of my best friends since middle school was a super high achiever growing up, and her mom hated me. My family is much lower class than hers, and while my friend was being offered whatever she needs in terms of push to succeed, I was being left home alone while both of my parents worked and partied from a young age. At one point when I was 12, my friend's mom told me to my face that she didn't like me, thought I was disrespectful, and I was going nowhere in life, and that I was going to be a bad influence on her daughter. The friend and I stayed close through high school and wound up going to the same university. We both had our struggles in the first couple of years. I had an abusive relationship and she got into drugs. Both of us took a hit in terms of grades from that stuff. I pulled out of my slump, finished my degree, and started working friend took an academic break. I saved up some money and went back to grad school, and the friend returned to work on her BA while living in a trailer her uncle owns from the 80s. I got a job in my new field post-grad school, and my friend quit school again and started working full-time at a bar, then got a DUI. Pre-COVID, I got invited to my friend's wedding, so I flew back home for the occasion. In addition to getting to support one of my oldest friends in a huge life milestone, She's mostly sober these days, and that's worth celebrating even if I do secretly hate her choice of husband. I got to see the look on her mom's face when she finally recognized who I was, then got to tell her about everything I had done since finishing high school. The master's degree, the six-figure job, the move across the country, my own marriage, and on top of that I got into fitness, and I'm a full five dress sizes smaller than I was at age 17. My husband got another woman pregnant in the middle of a planned move across the country prompted by a job offer for him. My job transfer came first, and I packed our 18 years of combined stuff into boxes, ordered a pod, and set off 2,200 miles away leaving him to just pack our stuff into the box. Two weeks into my new job and new house that he had signed the lease on, he calls me up and tells me that he's fallen in love with another woman, not the pregnant part. 
He then sells literally everything I packed on eBay, Facebook, and Craigslist before I could get back. He even tried to sell my dog and three cats, but my friends stopped him. I managed to salvage ten boxes of family heirlooms and my pets. Everything else was gone to pay for his new life. He sued me for alimony and the house and my retirement. I had no money for a lawyer, so I answered my divorce prose. I got tipped off on the baby, and that ended the alimony slash retirement piece of my divorce. He did get the house, I got my freedom, but I was nearly homeless by the end. No money, and four months in, my job laid me off and eventually closed. I was a mess. I decided to go back to school with loans. I managed to get by for two and a half years until I graduated summa cum laude. I got picked up by a lot of companies, but I ended up following my heart and moved across country with my new boyfriend to a house by the beach where I joked that I could have become a trophy girlfriend at 46. I'm currently looking at going back to school to finish my PhD and cross off another bucket list item. Life is more than good, it's plush. I've managed to be a breadwinner for 18 years and now I don't need to work, so I volunteer and do gig work on occasion. I grow artisanal weed and started to paint as hobbies to keep myself busy. Far better than working for corporate America, which I did for most of my life. My ex, he married his baby mama and had a son less than two months after my divorce was final. He exclaimed that he finally met, quote, the love of his life on Facebook. I wondered why he stayed with me for 18 years if I wasn't. She left him less than a year later with his son. He's now a single dad at 50, no real career and alone living paycheck to paycheck, and she's already remarried. And that's what happens when you just move on and live your best life instead of worrying about the baggage you left behind. We lived just across from a pool complex in a little street when I was little, and we consistently had an issue of people parking across our driveway. This annoyed my dad, but he was friends with the pool owner, and he would just get him to announce over the megaphone to move the car, and they would apologize and do so 99% of the time. Once, we had this one car that would park in our driveway and in our garage. The first time that this happened, my dad was just dumbstruck that someone had the nerve to do this. So, he did his usual thing to get them to move, and this 30-year-old woman comes up in a huff, all annoyed that we broke her swimming routine. She moves her car and goes back. However, the next day it happens again. So, he just parks her in, and goes in and gets changed himself, and goes to relax by the pool. After an hour or so, the owner comes along and says that the woman is complaining that she's parked in and wants to leave. My dad responds, She parks in my garage, she can leave when I feel like moving my car. She then storms over and demands that he moves it because she has an appointment, yada yada yada. My dad relaxes for an hour before finally moving it. He hopes that he taught her a lesson, but lo and behold, she does it the next day again. So he uses the old coat hanger trick to open the door and takes her passenger seat out and puts it around the next corner. He then locks it up and parks her in again. Sure enough, she comes around and demands to be let out. He does so without a word and lets her drive out. As she leaves though, she goes to put her bag on the passenger seat and notices it's missing. She does a double take and then stares at my dad in alarm. He just stares her down slowly, and then points to the corner where it's at. She's obviously startled, and drives off. We never saw her again. TLDR, don't fuck with my dad's driveway. It wasn't me, but a college buddy. It was so sweet, I have to share. There was a really beautiful, popular girl my friend, let's call him Mike, had a serious crush on. He asked her out several times, but she was always, quote, busy. She never really discouraged him, though, and I think that she liked the attention. One day, Mike got a hold of two tickets to a sold-out U2 concert. He bought them from a friend who had to go out of town for an emergency. Mike immediately called the girl of his dreams, and of course, she accepted. He was thrilled, and everything seemed fine. The night of the concert, they're at the arena waiting for the show to begin. Suddenly, she says, Oh, I see my friend. I'll be right back. You guessed it, she never returned. Mike stayed at the seats since that's the only place she would logically look for him. When the show ended, Mike ever the gentleman waited for a long time so he could drive her home, but saw no sign of her. She didn't answer her phone or texts, so he left feeling incredibly hurt. By the next morning, he was rightfully pissed. 
She called him around noon apologizing and says that she ran into her ex. And they had a long talk and worked out a lot of stuff and lost track of time. She had actually missed the concert and blah blah blah. He accepted her apology and asked if they could try again. She accepted and told him how very nice and forgiving he was. She had underestimated him. So the next Saturday evening, he took her to a very expensive seafood restaurant about an hour up the coast. He was polite and chatty the whole way up there, and he had made the reservation in her name. They were seated, ordered a nice bottle of wine, some expensive appetizers and entrees. Then Mike excused himself to go to the men's room. He very deliberately said, I'll be right back. He walked out to the parking lot and drove away. And at that moment, he became the hero of every good guy who's been treated like crap by a girl because she just didn't give a damn about his feelings.